We've been doing a series, anybody remind me of what it's been called? How to Live Your Best Life. And uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 31 in the New Living Translation says, let me show you the way of life that is best of all. And that's just before Paul goes on and writes what's known as the love chapter. And he's writing to people who thought that the most important thing in life was gifts, was how clever and talented they were. Um, the Corinthian church, it was a very gifted church. Uh, it, it was, um, Corinth was the city that you went to. If you were, if you were it, was a, it was the center of trade and commerce. And if you were a go-getter, a on-your-way person who wanted to make a success of life, Corinth was the city that you went to. And uh, so when Paul planted the church in Corinth, the people got saved. They were very talented and driven and gifted people but they're also one of the most troubled churches that Paul had, that Paul planted. And so he writes 1 Corinthians 13. And when he wrote this letter, he wasn't thinking about weddings. It's great to use it at weddings. You can use it at weddings. But he's saying this, he's saying to, these church, to the church in Corinth, it's possible to be very spiritual, to be people with great knowledge and understanding, uh, to be people with incredible faith, a get thing done kind of faith to be active in ministry, to, to be able to prophesy. And, and, and like if you walked into that church, you'd think, wow, this church is something. And Paul says, hey, you can do all those things. But if, if Paul is saying it's possible to do all those things and not have a supernaturally changed heart. And so Paul goes on and he basically says, you can do all those things, but if you don't have the most important thing, which is love, you are nothing. It all amounts to nothing. Wow. And it was actually a, a strong rebuke that Paul brings. And so he goes on and he begins to write about love. And we're just going to read those verses. We've read it again. And this is the last message in this series. So we're going to finish it this morning. Is everyone feeling a little sad or glad? Whichever way. Okay, so we're going to wrap it up. We, we're going to, uh, next week we said we've got Lucas Connell. But today, so verse 13, Paul says, if I speak, sorry, chapter 13, verse 1, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Think about this church. Think of what I just said. And this is, this is the context and this is what he's saying. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, you think, boy, I've come into a great church. But he says, if I have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Paul describes what love is. And then he describes what love isn't. He said it doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not proud, it's not rude, it's not self-seeking, it's not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And out of that, we've come up with the fact that your best life is a loving life and so this is not about either or you know we are gifts we're a church with gifts or we're a church with love it's not either or but it simply says hey this is the most important thing people will know that you are disciples of Jesus by what your incredible gifts by what your love you love one for another you'll be known by our love so that's what we've been talking on over the last gee this is the 13th Message, question, is it working? Is it helping at all? We've talked about being patient and kind and humility and respect and slow to anger and forgiving. Is it working? So this morning we're going to talk about speaking the truth. Last one this morning. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. The truth. What an interesting concept. Someone said only three things actually tell the truth. Kids, alcoholics, and yoga pants. I might add lycra to that, but that's another story. <laughs> Just imagine for a moment a world where no one spoke the truth. 
Just imagine that for a minute. No one kept a promise. It was expected that every leader would lie, where legal contracts were not expected to be honored, where teachers, where a teacher suspected of, every teacher was suspected of being an academic cheat, where no one could make a decision knowing that they actually had the facts at hand. What would happen if you lived in a world that was like that? The economy would collapse, rule of law would be impossible. In fact, it is well, a well-known fact that one of, the basic re- one of the main reasons why communism actually collapsed was because no one would trust the papers, no one would, not like us, no one trusted the government, no one trusted banks or institutions, no one trusted doctors. Why? Because it was expected that everyone lied. And as a result, the community disintegrated. So without truth, societies actually fall apart. Without speaking the truth, societies actually fall apart. The world does not work without truth-telling. Communities fall apart and cannot function. Literally, lying, not speaking the truth, pulls communities apart. It separates people. It disintegrates. And I think it'd be true to say that we have a little bit of a crisis of truth in our current world. I think a... Classic example in the last recent history is a huge company by the name of VW lied about their emissions they, in their software. Anyone remember this? Um, you know, the, for cars to sell, they've got to, you know, produce the most, do, be able to do the most kilometres with the least emissions and the best performance and the best economy, etc., And it was, it was found out that VW had actually covered over the whole thing. It was quite, it was like, wow, a whole long-standing company, they actually lied about it and people just went, oh. In fact, I've got two VWs. What does that say? I don't know. <laughs> fact is, if you don't speak the truth, you disintegrate. It actually does something to you. If you lie, if you, are not, if you do not tell the truth, if you lie, you will quickly feel yourself isolated and lonely and disconnected. Because truth-telling is integral to us living health, healthy, functional lies, lives. Let me give you another, I'm going to go to another passage this morning, which I think expands this whole idea of telling the truth. I'm going to go to Ephesians 4. Now, Ephesians, particularly chapter 3 and chapter 4, is, is, all, about, is all about our need for Christian community. It's all about the church and how it should be as a community of people together. It's all about togetherness and unity. It, it, it describes what the church needs to be, that, that community, church community is not just, you know, fellowship, inspiration and singing, but that in fact, because we're in this community that we actually grow and mature in every aspect. In fact, so a part of growth and maturity actually comes by being in community. We actually, because of the community that we are in, because we are the body of the church, body of Christ together, that supernatural change occurs. Let me read chapter 4, verse um, 14. So that's the context of, of how the community, how the church, the body of Christ, of how it grows us and matures us. So let me read to you verse 14. It says, Then we will no longer be infants, so we'll no longer be a bunch of babies, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunningness and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. So firstly, because we're the church together, because we're the body of Christ, that we're actually, it's it's gonna mature us. It's gonna grow us. We're not gonna be babies. Babies, I love babies. We dedicated six of them last Sunday. One had a great morning. 
Uh, if, if you're in the second service, we did that. and said, oh, did that happen in the first service? I must have slept through that bit. Um, so, you know, we, we love children, but, um, you know, a, a little baby, you know, making nappies and gurgling and throwing the toys out the cot, that's one thing, but when you see a 25-year-old baby, that's a tragedy, right? So it tells us what this community looks like. It says we're not, and, and, and it, show, it says we're not marked by, we're not, we're not marked by deceit. We're not a deceiving, we're not, there's truth in that community. And then it goes on, it says in verse 15, it said instead, so we're not deceiving or scheming or we're not a bunch of babies, but instead, and his, this is the key to growth and maturity, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is in Christ. So as a result of being together in this community, we actually grow and mature, but the proviso is that we speak the truth in love. Follow me. That's the key. So for us to grow and mature, there has to be a speaking together, sorry, speaking the truth in love in order for us to grow and mature. Which kind of says we need to be in fellowship, right? The way you and I mature and not be babies is that we are together in community and we speak the truth in love. And when that happens, when we learn to speak the truth in love, when that happens, we actually become our true self. We become who we're meant to be. Now that should, that should prick our interest. You know, it's like I've, I've actually becoming what God intended me to be. It's like Pinocchio. Pinocchio wanted to be a real boy. And how did he get to be a real boy? Anyone know the story of Pinocchio? He got to be a real boy by telling the truth. When he lied, he turned into a donkey. Does anyone remember? Everyone's going to be watching Pinocchio this afternoon. Everyone just thinks of whoop and grew a big nose every time he lied. But, but the fact is, Pinocchio become who he was meant to be. He become a real boy when he learned to tell the truth. You become what you're meant to become. We grow and mature when we learn to, to speak the truth in love. Are you hearing this this morning? Yeah. It doesn't happen in isolation. You know, I'm just, I'm just, it's just me and my, you know, my, my family and my TV. Or my, it, it happens when we as the church come together in community. We're joined in a meaningful way. And we couldn't do that during COVID, but now we can, right? So, if you think about why is that, why is that so? <laughs> Who remembers Professor Subner Miller? Never mind, I said something completely irrelevant to most of you. Um, he was a famous professor and he always used to say, why is that so? Never mind. You see, what made you what you are today is not just the decisions that you've made yourself. It has a lot to do with the family group you grew up in, the culture that surrounded you, the examples you saw, the relationships you had. Am I right? But also, if you jump outside of your immediate family, the school you went to, the community that you grew up in, and the values that they espoused had a lot to do with making you who you are today. And Paul is saying what will change you is a community at least as connected as your family is. A counterculture, something that is going to help shape and form us into the image, into maturity, the thing that God wants us to become. That doesn't happen in a bubble in isolation. It happens in the family of God together. It's the way that it works. Paul is saying that what will change you is a community at least as connected as a family. And it's, that, that is not just going to happen at a church event three or four times a month. That's a good start. And that's, that's, that, is, that is a step in the right direction. But listen, it's going to take, it, it comes about by being plunged, by being connected into a 
community that speaks the truth in love. Are you hearing this this morning? It's why we believe in life groups here. It's about people doing life together. The Bible teaches us that we are members of the body of Christ. We are all body parts, but we're joined. We're fused to other people. And he, listen carefully. The thing that keeps the body together is truth-telling. There's other things, but this is a very important one. You start lying, and you see how quickly you become a lonely person that's disconnected from people. Lying separates people truth-telling unites people. Now, that might be the opposite to what you think, but it's actually a fact. And it works in any community. Look what verse 25 says. It says, Therefore, each of you should put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. It's not just the church community, but in the community in general. Human community is impossible without truth-telling. And the goal, listen carefully, the goal of truth-telling is to bring people closer together. Because that is maturity. The outworking of maturity is people living together. Yes? Really? When I speak the truth, people run a mile. How does speaking the truth bring us together? In fact, when other people have approached me to tell me the truth, I usually run a mile. Well, the answer is found in verse 15, which we just read. Speaking the truth, what? In love. Love. <laughs> Speaking the truth in love. And there it is. I had me a little whiteboard up here. I'd draw a triangle on it. I should have did one and put up on the board. A triangle. And there's three corners to the triangle. It says, speaking the truth in love, we will grow up. So there's three corners to the triangle. There's truth, there's love, and there's maturity. There's growing up. Can you see that? Can everyone visualize that? Truth, love, grow up. So let's look at each of those for a moment. Firstly, truth. What is truth? Truth is more than giving facts. Truth never deceives. When I say something, I don't just evaluate it by the content of what I say or said, but by what I am trying to accomplish with what I say and said. What is the purpose for which I am saying that? See, you can say something that is factually true, but designed to deceive. Yeah? In fact, so much of a prevalent thing is this in human nature that psychologists have now given it a name. It's called, does anyone know? It's called poltering. You can look it up, P-A-L-T-E-R-I-N-G. It's a word, poltering. It's the art of lying by telling the truth. And people feel better about poltering than they do than lying. They go, well, I didn't lie, I told the truth. How did you like my casserole? Wow, I've never tasted anything like it before. <laughs> I lied. I mean, I told the truth, but I deceived, right? It's like, you know, trying to get a young kid trying to take their vitamin tablets and they didn't want to take them, so they go and they flush them down the toilet. And then mum and dad says, have you had your vitamin pills? And the kid goes, no, I flushed them all down the toilet said in such an ironic way that parents believe that they say, yes, they've actually taken their pill. Who smart kid? No, never mind. You see what I'm saying? Poltering. Let me give you a famous one. Some of you would remember this. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. You don't remember that? Poltering. We tell the truth, but we deceive by telling the truth. In fact, verse 14 calls it craftiness and deceitful scheming. So to speak the truth, listen, is not giving factual information, but it is not deceiving. Who can see there's two different things there? Right? So truth, that's, we spend a lot of time on that, but let's move on. Truth is one corner of the triangle. What's the next one? 
Speaking the truth in love. Okay. Truth telling and love always must go together. Just like a horse and carriage. (laughs) Truth telling and love have to be connected. They always must go together. They must never be separated. If you do, truth telling is not going to bring people together. It's going to blow them apart, right? And this is where we've got to get this. Truth telling without love, listen very carefully, truth telling without love isn't actually about truth. It can be harsh, cruel, point scoring, pull someone down to size. Hey, social media. How many of you think social media is great at it? Like using the truth, the truth, but actually it's not about the truth, it's actually about you. It's about point scoring, it's about pulling someone down to size. It's about hurting someone. And so it's actually not about the truth, it's actually about you. And whenever you do that, when the truth is not about love and it's actually about you, people are going to run a mile. It separates. You know, for some people, truth is like it's a club I've got my, my big club and it's got truthful nails and spikes sticking in it. <laughs> I'm just going to beat you up with the truth. Let me tell you a few things, son. Bang, bang, and you leave a mess, bloody mess. And you go, I've given them the truth. That's not about truth. That's about you. So truth without love actually isn't about the truth, but also loving without truth-telling isn't really love. Did you catch that? Loving without truth-telling isn't really love. So, I'm missing a page here. I am like Eve, I'm missing a leaf. I've actually missed a page out. You see, loving without truth-telling isn't about love. Let me give you an example. It's like, you know, a father fails to tell his daughter or his son about why their behavior is so destructive. And so because of, because I love them, I'm not going to tell them the truth. No, that's not loving. That is, actually, that is actually about you because you're, you're, you're too afraid to receive their disapproval for a short period of time. And you've actually, you've actually exploited them. You've taken away from them the opportunity to see something, get a sense of reality and grow, right? So it's actually not loving at all. It's about you as well. You need to actually... Just take some concrete, harden up and and be able to speak the truth if you really truly love. So speaking the truth without love isn't about the truth, it's about you. And, and, And loving without speaking the truth is actually about you. Did you catch that? So this is an important thing because I don't think we're good at it. Well, okay. I don't think I'm good at it. Have I got any friends out there? Please help me out here. You can tell me the truth if you like, but just do it in love. And the outcome is really important. For us to grow and mature, for this community to be healthy and function, for, mature, for us to not to be a bunch of babies anymore, we have to learn to speak the truth in love. And what we tend to do is go from one extreme to the other. We, we're either all on the, we're on the love camp. It's like we, you know, we never tell anybody anything. We, never, we never, don't dare tell anybody the truth. Well, that's actually not love. That's actually cowardness. 
That's about you. You're afraid of upsetting the apple cart for a moment. Or we go, where does the truth tell? I'm the church policeman. I'll set them straight. I'll do the Holy Spirit's job because he ain't doing a very good job. And you wander around as your club of truth telling. And you end up, so both of them are wrong. So we've got to learn to tell the truth in love. Are you with me this morning? So, how do I do this? Let me just be as practical as I can. Already write these down if you're taking notes and I would encourage you to do so. The shortest pimple is, shortest pencil, pimple? A pimple's a little bit like a pimple but it's, it's got, anyway, never mind. It's a pimple with lead in it. It's a pimple, all right? Uh, the shortest pencil is better than the longest memory, all right? So it's good to write things down. So how do I, how do, I do this? How do I speak the truth in love? Who wants to know? Number one, check your motive. Firstly, check your motive. Why do I want to do this? Is it just because someone's not living up to what I think should be their standards? The Pharisees were great at that. They were always telling the truth because people weren't living up to their level of, of holiness, right? So this is not about, if that's, your, if that's your motive, it's like, I'm offended by your, and you just, you're walking around the community telling everybody the, the truth. So check your motive. Is, is it because of your own personal standards or is it because maybe you're jealous of them and, or maybe they just irritate you? Maybe it's about style or taste. You know, you just don't like their taste or their style and so you feel like you have to keep telling everybody. That's not a good motive. Maybe you're just annoyed or angry or maybe you feel a little superior. Or... I, th- I think sometimes we often criticise in others the weakness we don't like in ourselves you know Jesus talked about that he said hey don't go and try and take the plank out of your brother's eye when you sorry don't try and take the speck out of your brother's eye you know it's going hang on a minute you just got this teeny wee little speck and then you're walking around you got this big plank and you're only knocking everything over and it's like that's what that's the irony that that Jesus is saying, but we, we can do that. We, we can try and be great at trying to remove specks. So check your motive. And the motive has to be to help and not hurt. Paul is a great example here. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 19. He says, everything that we do, dear friends, is for your strengthening. Everything we do is for your strengthening. It's not because I'm offended or, you know, it's, it's outside of my comfort zone or whatever. No, no, no. It's for your strengthening. If it's not for their strengthening, in fact, verse 25, will, have I got it in here? Verse 25, a bit later, and says, speak only what is helpful for building others up. Speak only what is helpful. But so often we... We're not speaking what is helpful for others and building others up. We're speaking only what is helpful to us and to get it off our chest. So everything we do, Paul says, is for your strengthening. Proverbs 27 and verse 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. In fact, I'm prepared to risk the friendship to tell you the truth. I love you so much and committed to you so much that I actually risk it to tell you the truth. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Generally, we only do loving truth-telling to people we want an ongoing relationship with and we care about as a principle. So number one, check your motive. Number two, plan what you're going to say. Plan your presentation. Think about it. 2 Corinthians 2.4. Listen to what Paul says. This is before, you know, Paul gives them a really stern word. He said, I wrote to you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. Wow. Some of you can relate to that. This is not just kind of an impulsive reaction, let them have it. You've just upset me on the day. There's a, there's a, planned thinking and it comes out of an absolute motivation of your love the depth of your love for them right 
So plan what you're going to say. Think of, so the planning involves when are you going to talk. When are you going to talk about this? Timing is everything. Just, just listen to a drummer playing out of time and you'll soon work out the timing is everything. Timing is everything. Can I just say, I have waited months. I've waited six months. I've waited a long time sometimes before I've spoken the truth to somebody because I so want them to receive it, right? I've waited a long time because I want them to be in the right place to receive it. Esther had some truth she wanted to tell the king and she waited three days and she prepared and she thought about it and she got herself ready. We need to take that same approach. This is what speaking the truth in love involves. It's not just like, yeah, well, you've upset me today, so I'm going to tell you the truth. That just destroys, that blows people apart. How many can see the difference between those two? The when. It's not last thing in the car park. Yeah, by the way. It's not when they're under a heap of pressure or you're under a heap of pressure. You want them to receive it. And can I just say, ask God for the right opportunity. He'll give you one. Timing is everything. When? What? We can tell the truth in so many different ways. One of the great ways to tell the truth is examples. I love, I love the way when Nathan the prophet come and had a word for David after he sinned with Bathsheba. He comes and he doesn't go, you're an adulterer. Well, that would have been the truth, right? He comes to King David and he goes, let me tell you a story, David. There was a rich, a, a rich, a, a poor man. He had one sheep and he loved that sheep so much. And then there was a rich man who had thousands of sheep and one day he wanted to have a feast for his friends. So instead of taking one of his many sheep, he goes and he steals the one sheep that that poor man had and he killed it and he made it his own. And David got angry and he goes, because he was a shepherd boy, Right? He knew what it was like to put a sheep over his shoulder. And he gets mad and he goes, who was that? They deserve to die. How many of you know right there, David jumped in the bag and zipped up the top. And then Nathan goes, you're the man. <laughs> now, I said that to be funny, but how many of you know that we need to think about what we're going to say? How we're going to communicate it? And this is not a long message on communication, but who can see the truth in that? So think about what you're going to say. Um... You know, and then how? How are you going to say it? Say it tactfully. Proverbs 16, 21 says, A wise, the wise in heart are called discerning. And what? What are gracious words? Words not necessarily that they necessarily deserve. Is that what grace is? Okay. But gracious words promote instruction so say it tactfully say it lovingly Paul you hear it in his words he's so loving say it gently listen to what Galatians 6 1 says and I'm going fast here but Galatians 6 1 brothers and sisters if someone is caught in a sin you who live by the spirit should restore that person what gently because watch yourself so you might find yourself in the same place gently So we do it tactfully, lovingly, gently. So plan your presentation. Okay, check your motive, plan your presentation. Number three, give affirmation. Let's move quickly. Give affirmation. 1 Corinthians 1, 4. Listen to the way Paul begins and ends his letter to the church in Corinth, which was a very rebuking, which was a very corrective letter. In 1 verse 4, he says, I thank my God for you. I always thank my God for you because of his Grace given you in Jesus Christ. I believe in you. I believe you're called of Jesus Christ. I believe that you're saved. I believe that you're born again. This is not about a, a, a reflection on whether you're saved or not. This is about the fact that you are, you are, you're a child of God. Who can see that? He starts with affirmation. And look the way he ends in chapter, in chapter 16. I think it's chapter 16. 16.24. He says, My love to you all in Christ Jesus Amen. I believe in you. I love you. You got that affirmation. And then lastly, risk their, and this is why this is so hard, risk their rejection. Not because you've been mean, not because you've been unloving, not because you've, 
been untactful, but you've done everything you can. You've thought about this, you've planned it, you've affirmed them, you've done everything you can, but you've got to risk their rejection. Risk, truth equals risk. Be willing to absorb initial anger. Yeah? It takes courage to do that. It takes security to do that. And then listen. It's worth it. Let me tell you why. Let me give you two scriptures. Proverbs 24, 26. An honest answer is like a kiss on the lips. Yeah, there's your life first right there. Put it, on the, put it on your fridge. Let me give you another one. Proverbs 28, 23. Whoever rebukes a person will in the end gain favor rather than one who has a flattering tongue. Is that good? Don't you love Proverbs? Have the worship team up, please. Community. Conclusion, I should say, sorry. I believe God wants us to build a community that learns to speak the truth in love because it's the only way we are going to grow. That's why my maturity doesn't come by me being all spiritual in my corner, fasting and praying for 4,000 years. It comes by living in a community of people who learn to speak the truth in love with a good motivation that's been thought about filled with affirmation but it's the truth and that's how we grow we know that intuitively don't we and it happens it's meant to happen most in the body of Christ you will know that they are my disciples by their love love rejoices in the truth that's what we rejoice over we rejoice in the truth thank you for telling me the truth You haven't exploited me. You've given me the opportunity to see reality and grow. Are you with me this morning, church? And we become mature. There's not smelly nappies all over the church, cots, toys flying out the cot, lying on the floor doing a little hissy fit. (laughs) We're mature. To receive this word this morning, church. And do you know what? Ultimately, it reflects Jesus. Jesus come, he was full of grace and full of truth. Says it. He's full of grace and full of truth. He's gracious and he's loving, but he speaks the truth. And he does it because he loves us. He wants relationship with us. And in doing so, he risks our rejection. Is that the truth this morning? Question, have you received the truth? Can we all stand for a moment? Have you received the truth this morning? Have you received the truth of God? If you haven't, just say, Jesus... I believe that you, the truth is you died for me on the cross. You gave your life for me. You said that you're the way, the truth, and the life. I believe that is truth this morning. I receive you into my heart. And that truth will save me. Thank you that I'm saved now. Thank you for telling me the truth. Mission Sunday today. You know, missions is all about telling the truth. And sure, we've been commanded to go, and that's a very good reason to go. But can I just say today, if we don't go with the motivation of loving people, we'll do more harm than good. If it's just about, well, I'm going to give you the truth, you're all dying and going to hell. Well, I gave them the truth. Let me tell you, you'll do more harm than good if you don't go. If you can't say that without tears in your eyes and a heart that's breaking and a well thought of how you can best communicate and have them receive it, let me tell you, we're not doing any justice to the truth. We go full of grace and full of truth our motivation is love 
It's about people we want a relationship with. We want them to become brothers and sisters in Christ. We want ongoing relationship with them. And, but in doing so, we can't escape this. We risk their rejection. But we're about the mission of God, which is about truth, yeah? Father, help us work this out. Help us to speak the truth. Thank you that you speak the truth in love to us. You're full of grace. You're full of truth. Jesus, you never shied away from the truth, but you were so filled with love. Father, help us as a church to speak the truth in love. Help us to bring growth and maturity to one another. Help relationships, family, those closest to us. Lord, help us to speak the truth in love. Help us not to run from it, not just to see it as something that drives us apart, but as we learn to do it, Lord, that it would pull us closer together. That that truth would be that funnel that pulls us close together because it's said and couched in love. Help us to do this, Father, that we might be mature, not lacking anything and reflect who you are. Father, help us to work this out in mission. Help us to do mission with motivation of love, relationship. I ask this this morning in Jesus' name.